Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone who's in the room here with us today, as well as those who are watching online. If you are online watching this conversation, please feel free to interact with us through hashtag WEF24. I am Anne Dumaliang. I am a global shaper from the Philippines. I do cars restoration work just an hour and a half away from Metro Manila. And it's, what we do is ecosystem restoration, basically trying to overcome inertia for watershed rehabilitation. I'm excited and very curious about our discussion today because it is about topics that are very dear to me as an environment defender. Our relationship with nature, science, of course, and the kind of AI that we should really be talking about, which is ancestral intelligence. <laughs> so at yesterday's Nature and Climate Dinner, we were reminded that human ingenuity is one of our greatest causes for hope in the unfolding sixth mass extinction caused by the climate and the biodiversity crisis. To overcome this challenge to humanity and our shared home, we must regain trust in each other, dialogue, work together, and consciously lean into each other's strengths as different people and as different generations. Yet to create genuine change and corrective systems, we need not just harmony with each other, but harmony really with the natural world. For this to happen, we must collectively overcome um, our ecological amnesia and regain our rootedness in nature. And to do that, we must listen to those at the front lines of the work. We must listen to environment defenders who are watching out for our most vital ecosystems, the science and the recognized indigenous forms of wisdom. That is wisdom really that we gained as a human race for hundreds and thousands of years about how to live with the all life around us and how to take care of our collective home. From here, we can have even better dialogues that can lead to evidence-based action. In the Philippines, our national hero named Jose Rizal is a writer and a naturalist, and he has a popular phrase which goes, ang hindi marunong lumingon sa pinanggalingan, hindi makakarating sa paroroonan. And translated to English, that basically means that whoever doesn't look back into his roots will not be able to move into the future. And I think that's very relevant for our discussion today. So gaps in these really threaten our ability to jointly forge solutions at the pace that we need to. With the future of our planet um, in the balance, we need to bridge these kinds of divides. The question now is how can we use these varied wisdoms and knowledge, traditional youthful innovation, indigenous knowledge, uh, science, really to inform and create a genuine long-term strategy for our planet. How can these inform a path that is guided by a realism to see the world as it is and an optimism that there is hope and possibilities in a challenging and uncertain future? And to start, of course, I would like to call on Dr. Jane Goodall, who really doesn't need any introduction for her opening <laughs> remarks. Well, uh, good morning, everybody, everybody here and everybody listening. And I, I grew up in a world that's different for, from any of the, those that you grew up in. Because when I was a child, there was no television. It hadn't been invented. And I think young people today can't imagine a world like that. So I was born loving animals and loving nature. And I learned by being out in nature. We had a big garden. And from books, those were the two things. We couldn't afford new books. Uh, this was during World War II. And so I used to haunt a second-hand bookshop. And one day I found this little book. I just had saved up enough pennies to buy it. And that was called Tarzan of the Apes. So of course I fell in love as a 10-year-old child can with this glorious Lord of the Jungle. And what did he do? He married the wrong Jane. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's when I dreamed that I would go to Africa, live with wild animals, and write books about them. No dream of being a scientist. And everybody laughed at me. How will you do that? You don't have money. Africa's a dangerous place full of wild, fierce animals. And you're just a girl. Not my mother. She said, if you want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard take advantage of every opportunity, and then, if you don't give up, 
hopefully you find a way. So, as probably you all know, I did find a way, and there's no time to go in for that. But I got lucky in being offered the opportunity to live with and learn from not just any animal, but the one most like us, the chimpanzee. We share 98.6% of our DNA with chimps. And it was amazing to find in behavior how like us they are. And nobody else had studied them in the world before, so wasn't I lucky to discover all the way they communicate the same as us, that they use and make tools. That was something only humans were thought capable of. And anyway, I eventually went to college. I mean, I, I was told I had to get a PhD, even though I'd never been to college, because my mentor said, well, we've got no time for you to get an undergraduate degree. I've got you a place in Cambridge University in England to do a PhD in ethology. I didn't know what ethology meant. You know, I wanted to be a naturalist, uh, not a scientist. Anyway, study of behavior. So I got my PhD eventually and went back and I could have spent the rest of my life in the rainforest ecosystem, learning how every plant and animal in this amazing rich biodiversity has a role to play. And this is what's happening in the world today. We're destroying ecosystems. Each time a species disappears from that ecosystem, it's like pulling a thread from a tapestry until the ecosystem will collapse. And what we must realize is that we are part of the natural world. We're not separate from it, as so many people who just brought up, brought, brought up in the city, they don't realize but we depend on the natural world for food, water, clothing, everything. But what we depend on is healthy ecosystems. And that's where we're going we're so very wrong. The biggest difference between us, chimps, and other animals is the explosive development of our intellect. So yes, we're animals are way, way, way more intelligent than used to be thought. And they have emotions like happiness and sadness, fear and despair. But, uh, you know, only we are capable of developing a rocket that goes up to planet Mars and a little robot crawls off and is taking photos. <laughs> At one time we thought we might be able to live on Mars, but now we know we can't. We've only got this one beautiful planet Earth. So with this intellect of ours, isn't it ridiculous that we're destroying the only home we have? And isn't it time now we're faced with the threat of climate change? And it's not a threat anymore, is it? It's reality. The changed weather patterns around the world. Last year, the hottest on record in human history. So the loss of biodiversity and climate change are interlinked absolutely. And the storms, the hurricanes, the droughts, the fires, the heat waves are getting more often <clears throat> and more frequent and worse. So now we're faced with this. So how is it possible that so many people in government and business and even just the ordinary general public are denying climate change? Oh, yes, the weather is changing. It is part of a natural cycle. Well, maybe it is, but we have... We have changed that natural cycle so that the world is heating up much faster than it did in the previous, um, the, the pre previous thousands and thousands of years ago, millions of years ago. So I was traveling around the world in the late 1980s, talking to young people like you, and also government people and business people and big audiences. And even back then, I was meeting young people who were losing hope, right back then. And I asked them, you know, why do you feel angry or depressed or apathetic? Because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. So if any of you think we older generations have compromised your future, you are so right. Um, in fact, we've been stealing it probably since the Industrial Revolution. We're still stealing it today. And that's why gatherings of people like you is so important. 
I, I began our program for young people, Roots and Shoots, to try and help people get over this feeling of hopelessness. Because in Roots and Shoots, Every group, choose, they choose their own projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment because of the interrelatedness. And the main message is every single one of us matters, makes a difference, has a role to play. And if you start working on a project that you choose, like some people are worried about litter, some people are worried about waste, some people are worried about poverty, this young people like you and between you you're probably interested in every one of the problems we face so that's my biggest hope for the future all the young people around the world once you know understand the problem once you are empowered to take action there's no stopping you I guess at this point and at this juncture, we can start the panel discussion. I'd like to introduce you to two more amazing women with me today. This is Mary Claire, who uh, led and co-founded the Youth Negotiators Academy. She plays a pivotal role in bringing young voices um, to the COP uh, to interact with decision makers who will be deciding on our collective future. And this is Hosanna. Um, Sana Silva is a TV presenter in the largest Latin American network um, television. And uh, she is very passionate about um, climate justice and the impact that it has on vulnerable communities. So I'd like to turn the attention first on MC. And Dr. Goodall, please feel free to insert in and comment anytime you like, Yuti um, You have been in a number of rooms with critical discussions. I'd like for you to share a story on when um, you know, science-based information and knowledge have significantly influenced the outcome um, of these negotiations. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And maybe just to start off, I think it's really um, disheartening to see that we are at the juncture where the science is actually challenged and it's the science from the scientists, but also the lived experience and the wisdom of indigenous peoples who are questioned on a daily basis, because this is our baseline, and that's what we should act upon. And so just then kind of to, to put it out there, because I was really frustrated to see that this happening here in Davos, but also in the multilateral negotiations. But in the climate negotiations where I'm mostly operating in, we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is an assessment of all the um, scientists around the world. And what I want to highlight, it's really exciting that they came together now in the sixth assessment cycle to actually really strengthen the voices of female researchers, bring in young researchers, strengthen the Global South participation, also really looking into the data gap we're having in many parts of the world. Um, and so really try to see how can we make the science more robust. Um, to ensure that the actions which we are basing on the science are then actually informed by the right science, um, which is adequate to the local context. And I think that's a really important um, driver for also for all of us to be reminded um, that how we are interacting with the science and that we have more um, also local scientists, but also that we take the indigenous wisdom into consideration when we are taking decisions. Because very often, especially in these places where there's very little um, data points and science, um, actually the wisdom keepers, and as you mentioned also, all the generations have so much to share which we really, really need to take into consideration. Right. And then your experience thus far, are there any particular frameworks or models for engagement that have stood out for you? May that be when it comes to engaging young people or bringing science into the fore? Yeah, what I think is very important also what, what you mentioned is the capacity building, right? That we have to support the young people, because it can be really, really scary to go into these decision-making rooms. Many young people, including myself, suffering from imposter syndrome, meaning that you go into the rooms and you're suddenly not able to talk because you feel everyone else is so much more important than who am I to actually talk here. So having the science and the knowledge is a really crucial tool for us to actually you know, start off this baseline. And, but it's not enough, right? We cannot just know the science, but also there's so many additional skills which we need to have. We need to have the courage and the will, but also something which we can maybe talk about later. How can we you know, 
be our true selves? How can we be authentic in these spaces where it's sometimes very, very challenging to speak the true nature of what we want to talk about without kind of going down the rabbit hole of just you know, perpetuating the system which we are seeing, um, mimicking the ones who have been you know, negotiating for the last 30 years and frankly haven't achieved what we have to achieve, haven't been listening to the science, haven't been listening to the indigenous voices and also listening to the voice of nature itself. In some of the sessions we've had, we've talked about acupressure points that could be alleviated, you know, and it will enable the system as a whole. So what are those pressure points that you've been seeing um, that need to be worked out on? What would you say are the key bottlenecks uh, when it comes to these things? Mm. I can probably address it in, 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 the same, um, in the same answer. That to me, the acupuncture point are is, for me is really about representation in decision making. Because decision making is guiding on how we are living as society, how we are living as humanity. And if these decision makers are taking decisions by leaving half the world's population out, which are actually the young people in this case, and shortly before it was the women, and so many other voices who are completely left out of these decision making when we talk about vulnerable communities, frontline communities, earth defenders, um, the indigenous voices. But let me focus on the young people for now. So young people make up more than half the world's population. Yet there are studies out there, only 2.8, 2.8% of the elected officials around the world are actually under the age of 30. And 30% 30 of the countries around the world have no young person in any elected position. I mean, that's a huge potential it's we are ironic. missing out, right? It's ironic, because we would be the main stakeholders of the future. Exactly. And also, we have just so much wisdom and energy and, and, and things to bring to the table, right? And also, when we have been seeing that the last 30 years didn't work, so we should change our approach. So for me, it's about diversity. It's about inclusion. But we also, when we are including these voices, we have to ensure that they are actually prepared well for their position, because otherwise, it can be a really devastating experience. We can maybe go into this afterwards, when I was a negotiator myself. Um, but this is, I think, like the crucial acupuncture point, because once we actually bring in new people and diverse voices, I do believe that actually these institutions where the trust is eroding, many young people don't believe in the governments anymore. We have tons of studies. They don't believe in the UN. They don't believe in so many of these institutions. And I think it's really dangerous. And I also sometimes tend to lose hope. But I do believe that if we have an influx of new diverse voices, we can actually regain and rebuild this trust with the institutions and make them meaningful again and make them effective again. And out of this, the actions come which then spark the hope. Awesome. Yes. Okay, now I'm going to turn to you, Asana. And, you know, the indigenous voices are also very important to have represented. I'm curious about an example as well of indigenous knowledge that has created massive impact when it comes to, you know, May this be biotechnology or fixing social issues, environmental issues that we have today? You know, actually, um, I'm from Brazil. So everybody that thinks about Brazil thinks about Amazon. Uh, there's a lot of conversation going on during this week about the Amazon rainforest, as Google uh, just said. And I think one of the key points is um, we have so much potential, but we also have so much vulnerabilities. And everybody talks about traditional communities, indigenous community, as uh, this main stakeholder that actually is not getting the access of decision maker uh, effective in an effective way. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, is the financing going to these communities, directly to these communities? In my experience, what I observe, I'm not an indigenous person. I have to point this out. I'm from a favela, and I'm a black person from Brazil, which is important to point out, too. Uh, in my observe, what I see is that we talk about, we, yeah, we got indigenous communities in the conversation, but we are not actually putting the value that they have. We bring them to here. They are staying away from their communities, which is a really important thing, mm. the connection with their communities. They're doing this so big work, and they're not being valued enough. They're not being paid enough. We have to keep this going. We have to keep this conversation going. Because, yes, uh, we, are so, uh, we put so much value on, on the scientific uh, part, and I'm a researcher myself, 
But the indigenous wisdom, uh, this knowledge, it has to be paid too. They have to have proper works too. And what I observe today is indigenous community, unfortunately, depending on donations. We actually had an episode, a really sad episode, um, a few months ago in Brazil. We have a really intense dry season in the Amazon that this community got isolated. They, got, uh, uh, they had a hard time to get proper food, proper water. And these are the community that we are so much really have to talk about. And they were, weren't able to uh, get access to health for several weeks. Another thing that I would love to point out, the Amazon rainforest, uh, especially the Amazonia, um, state in Brazil passed through a horrifying episode just recently, a few months ago, with this uh, thick pol uh, polluted air that's, uh, that just covered all uh, a really large uh, territory in the Amazon. So people actually breathe a really dense polluted air for more than three weeks. Imagine this, you open the window in the morning and you can't, you can't see the sky only gray, for several weeks, for more than three weeks, they, this was the reality of people living in the north region of Brazil, and no one talks about this. I, I didn't hear about this like once in this Davos week, and yet we're still talking about Amazon and, and how Brazil has this so much potential, when actually the population that lives in it's suffering today. We talk about climate change as this huge uh, distant thing, like this big dinosaur that is still coming, right? And we talk about how we are not going to get a proper, proper access to food, to water. But guess what? People are living this like today. I come from a similar uh, uh, living experience because I'm from a favela. And we had to live with, that, uh, with, with hunger with no access to food, no access to sanitation, no access to proper health care. And we still, when it goes to these meetings with big CEOs and big decision makers, they're like, we have to take care of the planet, otherwise we're not gonna be, we're not gonna be able to access proper food. And I was like, I lived that, like 10 years ago. <laughs> How we are supposed to uh, be talking about this, like a future thing and not get this conversation going about poverty today, about no access of proper health care today, about pollution. No one talks about pollution anymore. What happened? What happened about the quality of water? We have this joke about like, it's only AI, AI, right? Mm. But where is the conversation going about who is dying today? Brazil is currently dealing with a huge environmental uh, disaster right now. The last week, we almost, we had to deal with this. People are homeless right now. Actually, my phone got ringing this whole week about this. I had to get their donation to deal with this, and I'm only 26, come on. <laughs> I should be focused on this huge opportunity, right? I should be focused on my master's degree. And I'm, I have to deal with people dying. And I don't see the decision makers, these big, huge, figure persons, like coming in and say, yes, let's go. Let's deal with this. I'm going to devil's advocate for a bit. A lot of people sometimes do not recognize indigenous wisdom and knowledge as yes. real data to be taken seriously. Frontline environmentalists experience the same thing, right? Yes. Lived experiences are discounted. If they cannot be transformed into a report, then it doesn't get accounted for. But we can't afford to have that disjoint yes. because, well, we are in a climate crisis. We need to get moving faster than the pace we're currently moving in. Um, what would be your pitch to people who still have this um, perspective? Mm -hmm. If you were to pitch indigenous wisdom to them, how would you do that? Um, yeah, that's a really hard question. <laughs> 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 it, 
You know, um, I actually have like one, one a pretty example. Um, we have the, the cosmetic uh, market, uh, which is growing and growing and growing um, based on the Amazon um, biodiversity, right? But we need the indigenous community, the traditional community as well, uh, to get really proper access of this type of science if, because otherwise, uh, you're going to be spending a lot of money trying to find out the meaning of, for example, one fruit, the property of like one fruit, when people already know this like for hundreds of years right now. So the thing is that we actually uh, try to, to get in touch with nature from a market point of view. And when they, we should have this shortcut if we had this com the proper conversation with the traditional communities who l actually lives uh, on the on the forest like currently so we can see this in the whole uh, in the, a lot of different markets if you go in and say hey i want to do develop these type of products do you know any natural resource that have this type of properties we, we actually know that they can identify that more easily. This is something I also experience actually yeah. being in tourism on the ground. Whenever we ask naturalists to try to educate our rangers, within 20 minutes time, you can be sure that the conversations, the questions will change. Yes. It will be the scientists and politicians asking questions to our indigenous people, um, rangers. Yes. And I've also realized there are also across, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but across, and Mary Claire too, but across different indigenous cultures, mm -hmm. there are also certain forms of wisdom, certain kinds of principles that they do hold dear across the line. Would you have any knowledge or, you know, insight when it comes to that? I was just Mary responding to your, to your question before quite clear. But I think there is, it's very important to kind of, you know, value them at the same point. That's why it's so important to, especially when you talk about climate justice, that we bring this justice angle, which very often doesn't really get a lot of attention in research, because we maybe measure the CO2 level, we, we can measure a lot of different things, but we very often forget to put humans and nature at the center of our decision makings. And because we don't, or I mean, we could, we could also like, you know, measure it, but very often in science it's, you know, we have a different approach. Um, that's why I think it's so important to then have the other forms of wisdoms um, kind of next to it and see it as a whole like, like you kind of just map it all out and then look at it and say, okay, what, what, you know, kind of mapping do we have? And then based our decision, and I do very strongly believe that we will change our decisions and also our actions if we actually would map this as a, as a baseline. Um, but also I think it's very important um, on how we are taking the decisions because Mm -hmm. What we still see is that in a lot of rooms um, in, in the United Nations, but also in governments, and also here, we see a few dominant voices. Very often, it comes from a specific subgroup of, of, of people living on this planet. They're a tiny minority who overrule the whole rest. And also, like, looking into how do other, you know, groups of people take decisions. And I think there we also have a lot to learn from the elders, from, um, from indigenous communities. <laughs> But also, um, you know, from nature, just looking into nature, how does nature work? So for me, like, mycelium is just such a fascinating um, structure, how it's kind of all on the ground, and suddenly, like, the rain comes, and then the mushrooms are just, you know, coming up. And it's not, not about decision-making, but just kind of to see, like, how much beauty is out there and how much interconnectedness is there, um, and then how are we trying to solve the crisis we are seeing today, and how fragmented we are looking at this. How, Often we're just siloing in different rooms, and I think there's just so much, so much to learn. Um, but this really requires a lot of courage on a personal level to be different. Um, but if there is something we need, is that to, to be different, right? Because business as usual hasn't worked. Yes. So we need to do something different, and this needs a lot of courage because you have to get out of the comfort zone. You have to challenge people who prefer to just keep going because they benefit from the system as it's currently today, which is not benefiting majority of the people, and it's definitely also not um, benefiting the, the indigenous communities and the frontline communities, but also doesn't benefit nature itself. Um, and so how can we 
change his approach, and I do believe this is, again, something where young people, together with other generations, the ones who are willing, can actually change. That's why we have to work together um, to, to drive the change on how we are coming to conclusions and how we are actually driving these actions. Because what I'm seeing, unfortunately, is that very often we do take action, but we leave a lot of people out. So the actions are actually not climate just um, and are not human and nature-centered. And that's mm -hmm. another aspect going beyond the science itself, <laughs> but more into the decision-making and, and how we are arriving um, to the action itself. Yes. I know I was not answering exactly your question, but it's, it's just fine, it's it? a very important point to add. That's true. And then all, all of this is really important to fostering um, understanding and collaboration across the lines, not just when it comes to indigenous groups, um, science, you know, all of these things, but even across genders, et cetera. Um, Can I say something? Yes, please, yes, please. I, Just going back to what I was saying earlier Always. <laughs> about the fact that we all depend on mother nature. Yes. Mm. And science is important. Um, I had to become a scientist. I didn't want to, and I did just as well without it, but uh, it's important. Mm -hmm. And there's so much talk now about technology solving the climate crisis. Mm. But there's a much cheaper and a very age-old way of, of solving at least a major part of the climate crisis, protect our forests and protect and restore our forests, plant trees. Trees are going to take a long time to get the full carbon capture capacity of an old forest. That's why protecting the Amazon is so important now, and the Congo Basin, and in Indonesia and Malaysia. And I think one good thing about Brazil, I was just there two months ago, oh. was that uh, about 50% less destruction of forests since Lula came into power. And that's 2,000 square miles of forest saved that would have been cut down. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy and it's hard to pop police and all the rest of it. But this is such a very important part. And nature's been doing it for millions of years, long before we came onto the scene. We're just a new little species. Mm -hmm. And with this intellect that we've developed, how stupid we're being. How utterly ridiculous we're being. And you said another thing that's really important, poverty. And when I first got to Gombe in Tanzania to study chimps, it was 1960. And Gombe was part of a huge forest that stretched right across Africa. By the late 1980s, I looked down from a little plain, and it was just a small island of forest that's the national park. And around there, the hills were bare. There were more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, struggling to survive. So why were they destroying the forest? To get money from charcoal or timber, or get more land in which to grow food to feed their families. And that's when it hit me. If we don't find ways for these people to make a living without destroying the environment, then we can't save chimps forests or anything else. Yes. So that you know, on the one hand, we've got to alleviate poverty. On the other hand, we've got to reduce the unrealistic, unsustainable lifestyle of so many people on the planet. We also, and here's a thing for all of you young people, a nightmare that you're presented with, that already there are eight billion of us on the planet. Already we're beginning to run out of some natural resources faster than nature can replenish them. By 2050, it's estimated there will be 10 billion. And people are saying, well, if everybody acquires the standard of living just of a normal person, you know, not the super wealthy with all their private jets and blah, 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 uh, then we would need four new planets. We haven't got four new planets, unless Elon Musk discovers some that we don't know about. <laughs> but um, so anyway, that this is why I'm spending the best, you know, well, as many years as I have left, developing this program for young people because it's so unfair, the world that you've all been born into. It just is not fair. In fact, life isn't fair, is it? Some of the best people. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always speechless after <laughs> Dr. Goodall talks. Uh, did I 
I guess one aspect of discussion also that I'd like to bring would just be how we can all work together, you know, across generations, young and old, what do we have to bring to the table, right? Um, how can we leverage on each other's strengths? What can young people learn from those who've already had experiences interacting with people in positions of power? Um, and what can we as young people um, learn from them when it comes to forwarding all of these advocacies that we have? Any thoughts? I think actually, um, as again, a black person uh, from Brazil, and actually, my name is Osana Silva, I was just commenting that Silva is the most common name in Brazil because was the name given for a ma the majority of enslaved people that was captured from Africa. So they gave like this name as uh, to everybody. So I really interconnected with that history uh, as an Afro-Brazilian. So I was, we were just talking how the, tell me the pronunciation, ancestry? It is right, ancestors? Yeah. I'm a Portuguese speaker, so. <laughs> mm. It's uh, how, in, how we are actually valuing the ancestors' uh, knowledge, how we are really interconnected as, uh, there, there is this huge uh, percentage of young people that are actually grabbing this and saying, I am a black person, I am an indigenous person, I am, I am the future, so I need to know where am I going. So we go to the ancestors that we are linked in. Um, so we have, I actually, doing this process of going back to give meaningful reasons to uh, where we are today in the present, I actually got connected with some of traditional communities in Brazil. So I have a little quick example of how this knowledge can transform every, every space we are in. We have a, a traditional uh, community in Brazil called Quilombola Communities. I know you haven't heard of this. I don't expect you to know. Uh, so it, since uh, 15th century, it's a community based on Afro-Brazilians. It's an Afro-Brazilian settlement. First established uh, by enslaved people, enslaved people who resisted resist the, uh, the slavery, so escaped from slavery. So they get together in this rural area, and they had to survive, right? right? So they learn how to deal with the forest. They learn mostly Atlantic uh, forest. They learn how to get food to produce and not destroy it. So right now, they're one of the point of the biggest producers of food in Brazil that is actually based on agroforest, which is something that I actually heard through this week as this big new technology. And was like, we know that. Like a hundred years now, we already know that. They already, they actually are doing this like for years. And now science, uh, science and, and companies are getting to this because we actually get in the point that, uh, okay, we can't continue this way. So let's find solutions. And one of the solutions is, uh, is agroforest uh, system to produce food. And they actually doing this for years now. So this kept me thinking, are they going to be part of the conversation? Are they going to be seated on the boards? Are they going to be in panels in the plenary hall of World Economic Forum, actually doing opening speech and say, we knew that was coming. We know the solutions. We don't have the university degree, but yeah. we know the solutions. We actually have most of us because we need the degree to access some spaces, but we need to turn this around. Mm -hmm. We need to get mostly young people that are willing to fight for this and turn this around and say, yes, you know the solution. We need to talk how we can escalate the solutions to another realities. Okay, we have about five minutes left, but Tosana, <laughs> I wanna ask you also very quickly, we've talked about um, technology that we can gain from indigenous yeah. knowledge and indigenous practices. Are there any forms of technology today that you are 
finding optimism and when it comes to just scaling the amount of knowledge that everyone else knows, you know, about um, our indigenous practices. It's going to seem like I'm repeating myself, but for me, the bigger technology we have is people. Mm -hmm. It's talking to people. It's doing what uh, Ms. Goodwill just did, just said, um, going there, knowing the territory, living in the reality, and then coming back and say, okay, with all this knowledge, let's, right now, let's talk. Because what we heard most is trying to debate Amazon rainforest, poverty, and et cetera, and we actually didn't live the reality. I did live the reality of uh, Northeast from, from Brazil, a favela in Northeast from Brazil. So if I go to the Southeast and someone asks me, let's do a project to Rio's favelas, I'm going to say, I'm not the person, the right person for this. Please call someone from Rio's favela. Because living experience will make you uh, prevent errors. <laughs> make you prevent wasting money trying to build this new technological solution. And then when we go to the streets, you see that actually it's not going to work. So living experience, uh, um, this knowledge that came from bottle up is Connecting. so needed. It's so needed in f uh, most of our government space. We need uh, bottle up policies to be built today because they are mostly top down, because we still have this uh, uh, feeling that we need the degree and stuff to build these uh, type of solutions. So we need the bottom up solutions, because people, for me, is the biggest technology we have. Got that. Do you have anything to add, Mary Claire? Well, just to say that, as, as you also mentioned, nature itself is also the solution, and we have to yes. value it much more and, and give it the space it needs without constantly trying to, to fi find these quick fixes in technology, um, which are very often far off what is, what is actually needed. And I think also here in, in Davos, but many other spaces, we need to have more representation of nature in the rooms as well. Um, at least try to bring the, the voices of, of the forests, of the mountains, of the, of the water reserves you talked about, of the rivers, to the rooms, because I do believe that then the discussions will change if we, if we bring these representatives to the room, and if we also, what we can all do, acknowledge them in our everyday decision and say, okay, what, what impact does my behavior or our collective behavior has on these ecosystems, and how can we um, all become defenders of these, of these ecosystems um, to, to respect them, because ultimately, as you also opened, we cannot live without. And it's an illusion that we can make it without. And that's why, to me, it's so strange that we are actually not taking them into consideration um, when we're talking. So I, I do hope that we can all become stewards of these variety of ecosystems and bring them into our discussion and center them um, in, in all the decisions we are taking for our personal life, but also for our institutions, for our research, and um, maybe even like in governmental decisions. Okay. Um, if I have a last question, and it's just will just be very quick. Uh, what what gives you hope? You're two very resilient women that I also look up to. What continues to give you hope? Maybe the willingness and the courage to do things different. And I see how it's happening. I see also the barriers and the struggles and all of it together. But I very, very strongly believe that we have to have a lot of courageous people who are willing to stand up, getting out of the comfort zone, and do the thing because they believe in it, because they have a passion, and ultimately because it's driven by love and solidarity and um, compassion for, for our common home. I think that is something we tend to miss sometimes, right? Yes. We can be talking about knowledge, um, and data, but what also makes us unique as humans is our capability for empathy and relating to each other. And if we can extend that to the natural world, all the better. We can reach better balance, man-nature interaction sooner. Um, anything to add? Or shall I summarize already? Then we can pass it on to Jane for some yeah. closing. For me, 
Young People Gives Me Hope, being here with this 50 amazing young people that the World Economic Forum just gathered is what gives me hope. Okay, what I gathered today, um, that was a lot of great insights and information. Number one, rights of nature, very important. Number two, making sure that minorities are also represented in the decision-making table, given the capacity to take action. Um, making sure that there's not a single minority group that's leading all of these discussions that will determine the future of our world. Number three, um, technology and just how we perceive, perceive it. There's technology coming from nature, technology from looking back um, into our history. Now, I'd like to turn it over again to Dr. Jane if you would have some few closing remarks before we get some questions. Okay, well, first of all, you asked a question that I don't think was answered, and that is how do we change the minds of the decision makers mm -hmm. of today? And the, the way that I found is the most important to understand that when people change, it isn't because fingers are pointed at them, it isn't because people shout at them, it isn't because people tell them they're bad and wicked. You've got to reach their heart. Yes. They must change from within. And as I think I said, well, maybe I didn't. I've given so many talks this week. Um, but for me, telling stories. And if you tell the right story, that means you've got to spend a few moments finding out who you're talking to. Who are they? Do you have anything in common? Maybe you both love dogs or something like that. And then try and find a, a way to reach into the heart. And it works because... I've seen again and again young people can be absolutely correct in what they're saying. They're quite right to be angry, uh, but it doesn't work usually. There may be lip service paid to them, but it's, it's, you've got to get in here. So that's, that's one thing. And then you ask about what gives hope. Well, I already said at the beginning, it's all of you young people that give me hope because of what you're doing and how you're doing it and how it's, it's courage and persistence and determination. Um, I've seen it in children of six, and I've seen it, we're now including adults in Roots and Shoots. And it's a program that's changing people's lives, I get told every day. And now, because we began in 91, there's some of our early members in decision-making positions, and they hang on to the values they acquired. And what are the values? of roots and shoots, compassion, respect. Uh, these are so important. Love, you can't love everybody, but you can respect who they are. And then my next reason for hope is nature's resilience. I talked about the bare hills around Gombe. They're not bare anymore because the people have understood that protecting nature isn't just for wildlife, it's for their own future. And so there are partners in conservation. And nature is so resilient that seeds left from the trees that were there, and sometimes even the roots, even after 10, 15 years, there's a magic life in those seeds that new trees will spring up, helped with a little planting of the right trees in the right place at the right time. Animals on the brink of extinction can be and have been given another chance because people care. Uh, because people know that we need nature, we need the resilience of an ecosystem. And then, yes, technology used in the right way, but the scary thing to me about AI is if it's in the hands of some of these people out there in big positions in the world, it's a very dangerous thing. And that's going to be another problem to be tackled by the young people of today. How do we use this, this AI that's let loose on the world? when it can so easily fall into hands. It should make all this, this fake news so much easier. And then finally, there's the indomitable spirit, the people who tackle what seems absolutely impossible and won't give up and very often succeed. And if they don't, they inspire others around them to carry on the fight when they've gone. And that's why, in case some of you are wondering, that's why I carry around He's called Mr. H, because he was given to be by a man called Gary Horn. 
Gary went blind when he was 21. He decided to become a magician. He was told, well, how can you be a magician if you're blind? He said, well, I can try. If he was standing here, you well, no, you, he couldn't be surrounded, but if it was a normal audience of young people, you probably wouldn't notice he was blind. And then he will tell the children, if things go wrong in your life, don't give up, there's always a way forward. He uh, taught himself to paint. He never painted before. He's painted a picture of Mr. H. He gave me Mr. H 32 years ago for my birthday, thinking he was a chimpanzee. But of course, I made him hold the tail. Chimpanzees don't have tails. <laughs> he said, never mind, take him where you go and you know I'm with you in the spirit. So he's been with me to 62 countries and he's probably been touched by I don't know, millions of people, because I say, when you touch him, the, the, this amazing spirit of determination rubs off on you. So We're all going to try to touch him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who gets to touch it first take among it. the audience take wins the prize? <laughs> uh, I guess it's now time to open the room for questions from the audience. Do we have any questions from the audience for our panelists? Let's go with David. You're not allowed to keep him. You've got to pass him around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who raised their hands? Okay, David, let's go. First of all, from all the Taoist events I attended, um, this is my absolute favorite. Thank you so much for all the interventions that you provided. Um, trust in the communities is really important to get Trust in the communities and establishing trust, a trustworthy collaboration is really important to get things going. Oftentimes the language that the community speaks, the local community, and its indigenous wisdom is very different from the language policymakers speak or maybe the language scientists speak and researchers speak. And therefore I think oftentimes the knowledge is not valued enough. Mm -hmm. How can we create further trust and also provide these translations that are really, really required in order to value and integrate this wisdom that you mentioned into our systems. Maybe I can actually Jumpy. Um, yeah. respond, because also I know of the work you're actually doing, um, and actually using technology and using AI to support that this wisdom is actually spread, that this wisdom is translated, and is actually being able to find its way or, or is multiplied through, through, through decision makers to actually come to decisions. And I think this is, for example, a very fantastic use of artificial intelligence, which has a lot of downsides, that without it, we probably would ignore the wisdom because it's kind of too complicated to translate it, um, but also to really give it the platform it, it deserves. But I think also what you talked about, like the connection, that it's not, again, getting really extractive and we just kind of take what we can, um, but how can we really value these contributions in a way that everyone benefits from it, um, including the ultimate decision, which is to protect nature. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have a question from this man at the back. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question for you, Jane. Uh, my name is Arno Ratzinger. I'm also with the Global Shapers. And I find it so inspiring, as you said, like this is nothing new, right? It's not like just the last two, three years that young people stood up and started to ask for more ecological uh, equality or climate justice. Um, but what I find so mind-blowing when you look at footage from the 80s or 90s of environmental activists and young people standing up is how is it possible that we are still today in this mess where you still feel like we're at the same point as 40 years ago? What happened with those young people in the 80s and 90s that they were able to actually you know, really speed up the transformation that is so dearly needed? And what can we as young people do or watch out for it to not fall into the same trap and um, you know, follow the same patterns that weren't successful so far. Thank you. Well, first of all, some of those young people who joined us in 91, the early 90s, uh, they are making a difference. Uh, there's one example I give you, the Minister of Wildlife in Tanzania, under Megafuli, who was a, he was like a Putin, people disappeared if they disagreed with him. And he wanted to build, build a dam in a World Heritage Site, uh, and, and he started, cut down 2,000 trees, ruining the environment. And he announced on radio, 
and television. Anyone who, who opposes this will face the consequences. In other words, they'll be disappeared. Well, this minister uh, did stand up to him. Uh, luckily, he only lost his job and not his life. We talked about it. He was in Roots and Chutes as, at school. And I meet so many decision makers now who were in Roots and Chutes uh, or some other youth group. So it, why isn't it changing more quickly? It's money, money, money. These people are so rich and so powerful and they lobby governments. And then you've got on top of that, you've got corruption. And on top of that, in many countries, um, if you try and oppose those powerful people, you lose your life. I mean, that was so in, in Brazil, I know, mm. and other, other countries around the world. So it's not easy. But the point is that, that awareness is growing among the young people. Young people are better equipped now. And so your, your generation, you know, you've got to do it the right way. And you've got to get together. That's been said again and again. Working together is so important, collaborating. That's why, for, for me, bringing together young people from different countries, nationalities, you discover much more important than the color of your skin or your language uh, or your culture, even your religion. We're all human. We all laugh. We all cry. Um, we all have hopes. We all have fears. So it's going to be tough. But my hope is that as more and more young people like you take over positions of power, and that's not easy unless you live in a true democracy. So it's tough, and I can't answer you. But all I can say is, that as I've lived 90 years, it's got a lot better. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, that's time's up for us. We need to officially close the session. Thank you all for making it this afternoon. Is it the morning or the afternoon? <laughs> Wherever you are. <laughs> thank you for making it to today's session. Uh, we are now closing it, but thankfully, Jane, Dr. Jane Goodall has granted us an additional 30 minutes of her time for other questions that people here might have for her. Um, so I do encourage you to stay behind if there are more discussions that you feel like need to be had. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.